Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're very excited to have you all here for our annual AML 101 training. Um, we're very excited to have Amber and David here from Outlier Compliance Group. Uh, many, if not all, CJA members are dealers in precious metals and stones and have reporting obligations when it comes to anti-money laundering. And one of those obligations is to provide annual training to staff, which is why we are here today. Today's training will focus on the AML basics, which can be used in addition to your own specific procedures to fulfill your training obligations as outlined in the AML legislation and related guidance. Now, just a quick reminder that if you're using today's session to train your staff, you'll also be required to keep a record which should include the names of the person who attended the session, the date, and what information was covered in the session. Both Amber and David are anti-money laundering or AML compliance experts and former bankers. Their company, Outlier Compliance Group, has been working with the CJA for almost a decade, developing compliance resources, providing consulting services, and sharing their expertise with members through sessions like this one. Now, before I hand it over to Amber and David, I encourage you to put your questions that you have in the chat, as we'll be able to address them at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, please welcome Amber and David. Perfect. Thank you so much, Alana. It's great to be here. And it has really been almost a decade. I, I hadn't realized that, but um, I think we've been working together, offering compliance programs for dealers in precious metals and stones since 2015, um, which is pretty monumental. So welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Amber Scott. With me is my colleague, David Bijan, and we are part of a con compliance consulting firm. So we're specialized in compliance consulting, um, including anti-money laundering, which is what we'll be talking about today. As compliance geeks, we tend to start with a couple of hefty disclaimers. Uh, we're not lawyers and nothing that we say should be interpreted as legal advice. We don't represent any government agency, so we're not from FinTrack, although we will be talking about FinTrack, which is the Financial Transactions and Reports Analysis Center of Canada, um, also our anti-money laundering regulator and financial intelligence unit. But if FinTrack says something that's different from what we've said to you today, then what they're saying is going to be correct. Um, in that it will be the official position of the agency. We will have some time for Q&A at the end, at which point we will stop recording. Um, but even in that context, I would ask that if you have any questions that involve the name of a person or an organization, sometimes those can be sensitive. And so if you can't ask the question in a way that's anonymized, especially if it's about activity that might be suspicious, then let's talk about that offline rather than in this forum. And finally, um, information should be free. And so this presentation will be available to you as members of the CJA subsequent to this presentation. We will also be posting the video on YouTube. And so this will be public av publicly available for you to share with your teams should you wish to do so. And from there, I will hand it off to David. All right, thank you, Amber, and welcome, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started with some basics. And for anybody that is a repeat attendee, um, a lot of this is going to be uh, things you've heard before. But um, for for new attendees, and also if you are considering training, we do need to repeat certain things. So let's get started with the basics. Amber, you can go to the next slide. Okay, hey, so we're going to start off with a very simple definition of what is money laundering. Essentially, money laundering is taking funds that have come from criminal activity and trying to disguise the source to make it look legitimate. Um, it is important to note that in Canada, under the criminal code, it is illegal to launder money, um, but also it is illegal for anybody to knowingly assist in the process of money laundering. Um, under the Proceeds Crime, Money Laundering, and Terrorist Financing Act, which is the main overarching piece of legislation in Canada that uh, defines our AML regime and outlines the obligations, uh, there's regulations under that. Um, companies must take steps to ensure that businesses are not used to launder money. We can go to the next slide. 
All right, so let's let's talk a little bit about an example here. Um, so an example would be a criminal uses cash or funds to purchase a gold bar. Um, essentially, this is known as the placement um, stage of money laundering. The gold bar is then potentially sold later on, and that would be considered the layering. And when the gold bar is sold, the funds that is used from the sale is integrated back into society as an investment or real estate that would be known as in integration. And those are typically the stages that are seen. Um, they can look a little bit different, but essentially it's always taking that criminal proceeding, criminal funds, and trying to make it look legitimate. Let's go to the next slide. So what is terrorist financing? Essentially, terrorism involves any attempt to influence or intimidate government or public at large. The offense of terrorist financing essentially involves collecting funds for the purpose of carrying out an act of terrorism. Next slide, please. So what is the difference between money laundering and terrorist financing? Um, they can obviously look very similar, but one thing to really note here is that in the course of money laundering, the funds always come from criminal activity. In terrorist financing, the funds can come from criminal activity, but they can come from legitimate activities as well. Uh, an example would be a charity. A charity could be set up to for the purposes or uh, donations that people don't make, they don't even know that it could be used for terrorist financing, but that could be an example where it, the funds are not actually from criminal activity. Uh, essentially, the outcome of money laundering is always to make the funds look legitimate, but in the terrorist situation, it is always an act of terrorism. So what is a DPMS? A DPMS is a dealer in precious metals and stones, um, and this is because you buy or sell precious metals, precious stones, and jewelry. So in Canada, the, the definition of a DPMS is anyone that purchases uh, $10,000 or more in a single transaction uh, or holds inventory of $10,000 more uh, worth of precious metals, and that includes gold, silver, palladium, and that can be in various forms, such as coins, bars, etc. A precious metal, uh, precious stones would be diamonds, sapphires, things of that nature, and they can include lab grown as well. And jewelry essentially means objects made from those precious metals or precious stones for personal adornment. In Canada, a DPMS is considered a reporting entity, and they have to comply with various pieces of legislation, certain obligations, and we're going to go through that a little bit later, um, which means you do have to answer to the regulator who uh, Amber mentioned already is FinTrack. So here's some questions that we get sometimes, um, you know, and, 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 and we often get a lot of questions. Am I DPMS? Do I need to follow these pieces of regulation? And it really goes back to that definition I gave. Um, so if you're holding that inventory, if you are, you know, selling in that amount, then you are a DPMS. So these situations were questions that kind of came up recently. Um, the, I won't read them out, but essentially always goes back to that definition. In, in the first four bullet points, um, the answer is probably a yes, but again, it's going to depend on the amount. Um, in that latter one, the traveling salesperson that represents a, a jewelry company, the jewelry company themselves or the suppliers would be the DPMS, but the traveling salesperson themselves would not be considered a, a DPMS. And, and and I'll just note there, you know, business models can be very nuanced and they can be very unique. If you have questions on if the regulations pertain to you, you can always reach out to us and our contact information will be available after, as Amber said. Um, if we don't know the answer, and sometimes we don't, we will we can reach out to the regulator on your behalf, or you can reach out to the regulator directly, and they will actually give you a policy interpretation that will state, yes, you fall within the regime or you do not. Um, so, so that is also an available option is contacting the regulator directly. <laughs> 
And speaking of the regulator, that is FinTrack, which stands for the Financial Transactions Report Analysis Center of Canada. Essentially, they are the industry watchdog or the, the overseer of the AML regime here in Canada, not only for DPMSs, but all regulated entities. And we're going to learn more about what those pieces are a little bit later and what happens. Essentially, the compliance officer, the person that is appointed as such dealing with compliance is the person that should be contacting and interacting with FinTrack. Um, there are certain types of reports that have to be reported to FinTrack, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So what happens if I don't comply with this AML regime? Um, FinTrack has the ability to issue fines. Um, there's criminal proceedings, and, and while we don't see a lot of the criminal charges in Canada, um, the second piece is AMPS, um, which is, stands for Administrative Monetary Penalties, and we definitely do see those. We have seen quite a bit in recent years, uh, some in the DPMS sector, some and not, um, but those essentially are the fines that we should be more aware of. Um, we can go to the next slide, actually. I think we have some examples there. So AMPs are essentially broken down into different categories, and it depends on how severe the offside compliance is. Uh, there's minor violations, serious violations, and very serious violations. Essentially, FinTrack will make an assessment. These are actually defined under law. So for instance, you miss a suspicious transaction. That is defined as something that is very serious and there's a number associated with that. But essentially, they, if FinTrack would look at your past compliance, um, how much harm is done by the missed piece of reporting in this case or, or the, the particular issue, and then your compliance with history. And then they will determine a number, and we have seen some of those. It's important to note that AMPs um, do get published, so there's a reputational risk also that needs to be considered outside of the dollar figure. And we can go to the next slide. Um, that speaks specifically to a couple that we should pro probably be aware of or talk of. Uh, the last, uh, sorry, the first one there for $66,000 is one that was recently administered um, late last year for DPMS. And, and you can see there that they were administrated for two issues, essentially a failure to develop and apply compliance policies and procedures and failure to assess a documented risk assessment. And, and we'll get into what those mean a little bit later. Um, the second one there is an older case from a few years ago, and, and in this one, the violation was a lot, the, the number was a lot larger for four violations. The DPMS actually took this to federal court, and then that is a process that can be done once a, an AMP is issued. Um, one thing to note here is that even though it went to court, most of the fines um, the judge actually sided with there was a reduction of about $25,000 roughly from that $222,000 fine. And it was relation to number four, which um, was the failure to develop and maintain a written ongoing training plan or training program. Um, when you read through kind of the case and, and, and the stats on it and, and the data that's around it, it looks like what happened there was FinTrack had interviews with staff, and that's something that FinTrack would do when they would come in um, during an examination. They will interview certain staff, um, a compliance effectiveness review, which we'll talk about later. A, an auditor does that. And in those pieces, what happened is the... Um, the, the staff that were being interviewed weren't aware that there was no dollar amount related to reporting of suspicious transactions. So in, in the court case, you know, th there's language around, uh, FinTrack wrote that in, in the um, letter that they issued, that the lack of training essentially around the topic of STRs led to the violation in number one. The courts didn't really side with that 100%, so there was a little bit of a reduction. I think the moral of the story here is it is a long process. It probably cost a lot more than $25,000 to appeal this in federal court. There is still the reputational damage there. So just be mindful of these administrative monetary penalties. In general, FinTrack is not there to 
give you fines if you are trying to comply. For the most part, they are repeat offenses. If there's an examination, they tell you to fix things, they come back and it's not fixed, you potentially open yourself up to one. There are some cases where there are fines issued right away, but those are usually where people are just not complying at all. So you don't have policies and procedures. You know, they, they come in, you're like, who's Fintrek? I know nothing about you. Those, those situations can happen, but generally they are more for repeat offenders, so to speak. And we can go to the next slide, which we're going to talk a little bit about the detailed obligation. So Amber, I'll actually kick it back to you. Perfect. Thanks, David. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about those detailed obligations. So what do we have to do because we're dealers in precious metals and stones? Um, There's certain legislation to which we're beholden. So as David mentioned, the Proceeds of Crime, Money Laundering, and Terrorist Financing Act, it has a set of regulations that accompany it. Uh, we're also beholden to the Criminal Code of Canada uh, and to ministerial directives. So these are directives that are issued by the Minister of Finance in Canada that obligate us to do certain things. And currently we have three ministerial directives. Uh, they relate to transactions that have a nexus to Iran, to the um, Democratic People's Republic of North Korea, or to Russia. And the Russian ministerial directive is relatively recent, being issued uh, earlier this year. And then we also have Canadian sanctions and sanctions talk about certain jurisdictions where we might have restrictions. They might apply to a particular type of material, to a particular type of product or to a specific individual. Um, we don't tend to have comprehensive sanctions in Canada, which means we usually don't block an entire jurisdiction, but there might be specific individuals, governments, entities, that are sanctioned, meaning that we're not permitted to deal with those individuals or entities at all. So as I mentioned, we have three ministerial directives. Those are fairly important to be aware of. Um, if you have any dealings that involve any of those jurisdictions, so, so again, Iran, North Korea, or Russia, it's really important to understand these regimes. And it's also important to understand where we might have things that have a nexus to those regimes where it's not apparent. So maybe you have someone who's a third party who's acting on behalf of someone in one of these jurisdictions. Maybe you have things that are intended to be shipped onto these jurisdictions or that have been shipped to you from one of these jurisdictions. And there is where we really have to understand the nuance of these ministerial directives and sanctions regimes. Uh, it's important to have it's not just enough, by the way, to say, oh, we don't, we never deal with Iran, and so we don't have to care about that at all. You still have to pay attention to what the through points might be, and when you might have someone who is acting as a third party or as a nominee who has a nexus to that jurisdiction, who's, who's doing a forward shipping, and what the signs of those types of things might be. Under the law, we have responsibilities uh, that are very specific. So we have to have a compliance program. A compliance program is generally considered to have five elements. We have a compliance officer, and this is quite simply a person who has oversight for our compliance regime. They're not the only person responsible for compliance. Everyone in your organization as a dealer in precious metals and stones will have responsibility under your compliance regime. And that's very important to understand but the compliance officer is the person with oversight. They have to be sufficiently senior within your organization. So you can't take your newest customer service rep who's there part-time in university and only in on weekends and say, congratulations, Betty. And also I'm sorry, but you're our compliance officer now because that person just doesn't have the authority to be able to have an oversight for a compliance regime. So it has to be someone sufficiently senior within your organization they have to understand Canadian legislation and they have to understand your business. And those are the conditions that they need to meet. There's no specific designation, but they really need to meet those three conditions. There needs to be policies and procedures. And a policy is something that describes, here's what we're required to do under the law. Here's our obligation. Where a procedure describes, here's what we're actually doing step-by-step step in order to meet that obligation. These need to be specific to your business. So here's what you're doing. Here's what actually applies to you based on your business model. And similarly, there's a risk assessment. And this is a document that talks about the risk that your business could be used to either launder money or finance terrorism. There are very specific categories. 
And this is what you use to show that you understand that risk and that you're remediating that risk in a way that's appropriate to your business. You need to have an AML compliance effectiveness review. This is like an audit, but for compliance, it's required every two years. And this is something that you can do internally if you have a sufficient function to do that, or something that you can have an external firm um, like ours do, but there's no obligation to have an external firm do that. Uh, if you have an internal audit department, it is something that you can do within your own context, but regardless of your size, it's required every two years. And you also have to have training. And your training, like what we're doing today, is applicable to anyone that touches your transactions, anyone that deals with your clients. And this might include someone who's just a temporary person um, that's there for only part of the year, maybe during your busy season, Christmas, Valentine's Day uh, type of thing. But you still want them to be trained because any individual that deals with a client has the ability to recognize a potentially suspicious transaction and they have to know that they're required to let your compliance officer know if that happens. And you get to that through training. From an operational perspective, so what do we actually have to do? We have to report certain types of transactions and we'll go a little deeper into what those transactions are. We have to keep specific records and it's not just keeping records, but any records that we're required to keep we have to be able to produce if FinTrack asks them asks for these records, um, usually within 30 days. And so we need to store these records in a way that we can sort them, that we can pull them, that we can produce them for a regulator uh, within a relatively quick time frame and in a consistent format. In certain situations, specifically when we have to report transactions, we need to identify our customers. And whenever we have to identify a customer, there's very specific record keeping obligations that we need to meet as well. Where we have a business relationship with our customers, we have to be able to assess the risk of that customer. And if they're high risk, then we're going to do some enhanced measures, some enhanced due diligence that's different from what we would do for every other customer in order to mitigate that risk. And we need to monitor transactions to look for any suspicious activity, which is any activity that we think might be related to money laundering or terrorist financing. Amber, before you go on, we have a question in the chats. Um, sure thing. Is there specific training for a compliance officer? There are um, a variety of different compliance officer trainings that are available. Uh, there is Camly within Canada that is very specific to um, Canadian compliance. There's a designation called ACAMS, which is the Association of Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialists, uh, which is more international. There's also um, um, the Association of oh, Certified Financial Crime Specialists, ACFCS. So there, there's a few different training pieces that are available for compliance officers. And if that's something that you're looking for, please feel free to reach out and, and we can have a little conversation about the nuance of what you're looking for and what might be the best fit in terms of your organization. Yeah. Um, and and we don't get any referral fees from any of those, by the way, That that's a... Purely will recommend based on what we think is a good fit for you, based on what you need and where you are in your trajectory as a compliance officer. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add there that there's lots of resources out there, but there's nothing specifically specified under legislation. It doesn't say the compliance officer needs X, Y, Z. So it should be really tailored to what you need specifically. Absolutely. Um. So in terms of keeping your program up to date, uh, you'll notice that, that it says here, when do these updates happen? And one of the things that I need to mention here is just document, document, document. Whenever you make one of these changes, it's not enough just to make the change. It's not enough just to do the thing. Everything that we're going to talk about here that you need to do from a compliance perspective, you need to be able to prove that you have done as an organization. So as we're talking through these, think about how do you evidence these things? In terms of your compliance officer appointment, you would document this whenever there's a change in compliance officer. Uh, so when a new compliance officer or a new backup compliance officer is first appointed. Your policies and procedures should be updated at least once a year, but this can happen more frequently when there's changes to either the legislation, so we have a new obligation, or there's changes to your business model. It's the same with your risk assessment, so you would have updates um, that you would do as a matter of course once a year where you're reviewing that documentation. 
Th these are living documents and they're really intended to reflect what you're actually doing as a business. So it's not enough to say that we've printed our policies and procedures and we put them in a binder on a shelf 10 years ago. Um, and we expect that to meet our obligations. They really need to keep up with what you're doing as a business and what the legislation is saying currently, which has changed substantially in recent years. You need to have training. Again, that training needs to be at least once a year. Uh, the idea with that training is that you can use something like what we're doing today, where we're covering all of those obligations on a high level, but you should also have something that covers your specific policies and procedures. And this might just be handing your staff a staff procedure, having them attest to the that they've read it, um, and doing a, a Q&A with them. So there are different ways that you can approach that, or you can do a more formal training session like this one, where you talk about how you're actually meeting those obligations. And finally, there's that effectiveness review that happens every two years. And for that piece, the results of that effectiveness review need to be presented to your senior officer, so your CEO, your president, um, that senior most person within the context of your business. And you need to have a plan in terms of what you're going to do to address any deficiencies that they approve. In terms of record keeping and reporting, uh, everything, like I said, related to your AML program, you need to keep a record of, and those records need to be kept for at least five years. If you aren't sure, so if you're a staff member and you're not sure whether we should be keeping this record or not, hold off on, on your record destruction and talk to your compliance officer about whether or not that's something that you might need to keep. Um, we also need to report certain transactions to FinTrack and in some cases other agencies. And wherever we need to report those transactions, we want to keep a record of that as well. Whenever we're required to report a transaction to FinTrack, we need to collect information about the customer who's the subject of that report. And we need to try to identify that customer. Um, in certain cases, it's a requirement. And in certain cases, we have to make best efforts to identify and document those efforts. There are specific timelines for each FinTrack report. And there's an expectation that we're going to submit the reports within those timelines. We can potentially face uh, deficiencies or even penalties for failing to report transactions or for having transactions that are reported late. Generally, the penalties do relate to failure to report transactions as opposed to we made an effort, but we were a day late on, on reporting. And that's important to understand, but certainly try to get them in within these timeframes. For large cash transaction reports, so this is any time where you receive cash, and, and cash means physical notes and coins in an amount of $10,000 or more, that's 15 days. For large virtual currency transactions, again, that $10,000 or more, and this is in Bitcoin or other virtual currencies, it's five days. Uh, for suspicious transactions, and this is where we think that the transaction might be related to money laundering or terrorist financing, that's as soon as practicable from the time that we established that there's reasonable grounds to suspect. And that's the same for an attempted transaction. So a transaction that someone tries to do, but maybe we tell them we're not able to do that transaction, but it's still suspicious. And finally, terrorist property reports. So where we know that we're in possession of property that belongs to a terrorist or terrorist group, that needs to be reported immediately. And those reports go to FinTrack as well as to the RCMP, our National Police Force, and to CSIS. Um, just a quick note when we talk about reporting that FinTrack has had a cyber incident and that happened in early March. Currently, many of FinTrack's reporting systems, including their online reporting portal, remain offline. Um, they've indicated that they don't believe that there was any loss of data, so there, there was no data breach, but out of an abundance of caution, they've taken those systems offline. Um, in the meantime, for some reports, there are APIs, so application programming interfaces, which is just how one computer talks to another, um, that are available for those that have the technological capacity to implement an API. This is what's recommended for the time being. Um, if there are any high priority suspicious transaction reports, so these are things that might relate to terrorism, national security, child sexual abuse material, something where, where there's a clear and present danger to an individual, um, then you can reach out and there are some email addresses in an appendix to this presentation. 
um, to contact FinTrack to um, get a mechanism, which is usually via Canada Post ePost, so very secure messaging in order to transmit that information to them. And then the expectation is that you would also fill out the transaction report in the online reporting portal once that's available again. Um, currently, reporting that's submitted um, that can't, or sorry, that can't be submitted via the API, it can be submitted once FinTrack's reporting systems are back online. And FinTrack has indicated that they're going to take a reasonable approach. So there's not gonna be any penalty for late reporting because reports were submitted after the period when the, the FinTrack systems were offline. And that's important to know, but make sure that you're still keeping complete records in the meantime, and that you're ready to, to submit those reports once those systems are up and back online. So let's talk a little bit about the types of reports that you need to submit. Um, we have large cash transaction reports, which are again, if you receive, so it's about the receipt, not about paying out, of $10,000 or more, um, in cash, so again, notes and coins, not any other types of instruments, um, by or on behalf of the same individual or the same entity within a 24-hour period. You are not permitted to complete this type of transaction unless that person can be identified, which is to say, if I'm in and I say, I would like to buy a Rolex, um, I'd like to pay in cash, and by the way, I've forgotten my wallet, you're not actually supposed to complete that transaction. Um, there can be a penalty for doing that without identifying that customer and collecting the identification information. And in the case of a, a large cash transaction report, it's absolutely fine to tell the customer that we're required to report it. Um, we we're, we're absolutely okay to tell the customer that we're required to collect their identification and to collect other KYC, which is know your client information in this scenario. Large virtual currency transactions are very similar to that. Um, rather than this being about cash, so it's not about that currency or notes, this is about a virtual currency. So like Bitcoin um, or anything else that isn't a government issued currency. Um, so not a fiat currency, but, but specifically a virtual currency. This doesn't include things like e-transfers or wires, um, which are not virtual currency. Th those are fiat currency, so it's government issued money uh, just using those payment rails. For both of these types of reports, there's something called the 24 hour rule, which means that if we have um, within the same 24 hour period, two or more transactions that add up to $10,000, then we would consider those to be in scope, um, which is to say that if I come in and I buy a ring in cash and that ring is $5,000, and then I come in two hours later and buy the matching ring, which is also $5,000, then I've hit my $10,000 limit and at that second transaction, then you would identify me, presuming of course that I'm, I'm paying in either cash or virtual currency in those cases, and you would collect information about me. In those situations, you also need to do what's called a third party determination. And a third party determination essentially means if I'm the person doing the transaction, you're asking me, Amber, are you doing this transaction on your own behalf or are you taking instruction from someone else? And instruction from someone else doesn't mean that my wife indicated that she really likes this ring and so I'm buying it for her for her birthday. Um, what we're looking for is more that, well, um, someone else has actually given me money and instructed me to come and make this purchase for them um, or they're directing me to make this purchase. And so I'm, I'm acting on the instruction of someone else as opposed to buying a gift for someone else. And I think that's an important distinction that we make in terms of, is there really a third party that's directing this transaction or not? We need to be on the lookout for unusual transactions. And these are transactions where we think there might be reasonable grounds to suspect that the transaction is related to money laundering or terrorist financing. And in these cases, we have to try to identify the customer um, if we're able to do so without tipping them off. And we have to, of course, let the compliance officer know about the suspicious transaction or the potentially suspicious transaction so that they can make a decision about whether or not this gets reported to FinTrack. Unlike the large cash or large virtual currency transactions, there is no minimum dollar value, which is to say that I could have a very inexpensive transaction that I think might be related to fraud or some other type of financial crime, and this would meet the threshold. Um, in terms of suspicious transaction reporting. The transaction doesn't need to involve cash or virtual currency, so you can be receiving any type of payment. And 
you would report these types of transactions even if it's not completed. So if I'm reaching out to you and I'm asking you about a specific transaction that I want to conduct, um, and, and maybe you're a dealer in gold and I'm reaching out and saying, hey, I'd, I'd really like to buy this gold bar. I'd like to pay for it in cash. Um, I, I don't want it to be reported. And so what I'm going to do to buy this particular bar is that I'm going to bring in $5,000 in cash every two days for the next three weeks. Um, and then and then you won't do any reporting, of course, um, and you won't have to identify me. If you say, you know, Amber, we're not going to do that. We're not really comfortable with that transaction. Um, you would still need to report that as being a suspicious transaction because there I've tried to structure my transaction to avoid identification and to avoid reporting. So those things um, are hitting that uh, reasonable grounds to suspect that that transaction might be related to something problematic. And here we talk about when do we hit reasonable grounds to suspect? So it's more than just simple suspicion. It's more than just a hunch or my spidey senses are, are tingling and I'm not really sure. I can't articulate the reason, but something smells fishy about it, but I don't know what it is. That by itself is not enough. Uh, you need to get beyond that to a point where based on the facts and context and indicators, you look at that transaction and you say, you know what, there, there's something there. There's enough for me to report it. So in the situation that I just described, where I, I was asking you to change the transaction um, or to structure the transaction in a way that would avoid identification or reporting, I would describe that in terms of here, here's the facts and context and indicators in this situation that would lead me to have reasonable grounds to suspect. Now, if you hit our next level, which is reasonable grounds to believe, you also definitely have to report, but you've gone way past reasonable grounds to suspect. Um, and so when would we hit reasonable grounds to believe? Well, let's say instead of just asking about the structuring of the transaction, one of the things that I told you as part of that conversation is, you know, I have to be really careful and not get identified and not have any of these reporting because the RCMP is keeping an eye on me because of my cocaine business. And it's just a real pain in my arse and business is going really good, but I don't want them to know what I'm up, I'm up to. And David is laughing at me, um, but these conversations actually take place. Um, I, I have absolutely seen suspicious transaction reports that have involved the criminal element talking to a reporting entity about their crime and about the fact that the, the proceeds of crime are being used to pay for a transaction or to fund a transaction. And if that happens, you have 100% hit reasonable grounds to believe, and it needs to be reported to FinTrack. Um, no questions asked at that point. In terms of the indicators that you should look for, there's all kinds of training online in terms of like, if someone looks up and to the right and, and that could be suspicious, but there's absolutely no perfect indicator. And I think that's important to understand. Um, criminals are not what you see on TV. They can very much look like you and me. They can very much be charming. There's no perfect indicator that's going to work every time. And in fact, sophisticated criminals are really going to change what they're doing to be responsive to the situation. If you're working at a dealer in precious metals and stones and you're you're just not sure about the behavior that you've observed, err on the side of caution, let the compliance officer know what you've seen and they'll help you understand what questions to ask, whether or not there's any further action that should be taken and they'll make a decision about whether or not to file a report to FinTrack. But as as someone who's not the compliance officer, if you're not sure where you stand in this continuum, is it simple suspicion? Is it reasonable grounds? Go ahead and escalate that to your compliance officer. Um, and, and as compliance officers, that's something that we should always hear out from our staff. It's part of the ongoing training and coaching that we do so that people understand what they're looking for in these situations and in our specific instance. And what we're going to see is going to be very different depending on the type of business. There's a very broad swath of businesses that are covered under dealers in precious metals and stones. And what someone sees as a retail jeweler isn't going to be the same as what someone sees as a wholesaler or what someone sees um, as a dealer in bars and ingots and coins. And that's important to understand as well. So we should really look for the indicators that are going to make sense for our business. Um, Regardless of the type of business, we're looking for things that are unusual given what we know about the customer. 
Um, if I've indicated to you that I am a cashier at Tim Hortons, but I'm coming in and buying gold bars in cash every couple of days, that would be unusual. Um, that That is the right time to start asking me questions about whether I'm acting on my own behalf, whether I'm acting on someone else's behalf, and starting to understand the nature of the transactions that are taking place. Um, and, and that tees up with the other indicators that are on the screen. So the transaction doesn't make sense. Um, there's, there's purchases in cash in amounts that are just under the reporting threshold. And not because that's what the item costs. I think there's a difference. We certainly see sometimes, especially if we're talking about things like finished jewelry and coins, where we might have items that have a value that's under the reporting threshold. And that's not what we're looking for. Um, it, it's really, maybe you have someone that's that's doing a layaway or that's paying for something in stages that's always bringing in that cash just under those reporting thresholds. Um, you don't, again, you don't have to hit reasonable grounds to believe. So you don't have to know that a transaction is related to criminal activity. There's a few situations here that I think um, as dealers in precious metals and stones, we should always be reporting. So one of those is if someone changes a transaction in order to avoid identification or in order to avoid reporting, if someone refuses to be identified. So if, so if I'm there to buy something and I, I refuse to pre present identification um, when I need to do that in order to buy the item, that to me is immediately problematic. Um, if you think that a customer has provided you false or misleading information. So if I, if I allow myself to be identified but I produce to you a driver's license and you're looking at it and it's clearly been altered. It's clearly been tampered with. The picture is not my face, um, something like that. Then those are things that immediately, I think, hit reasonable grounds to suspect. Um, if you have um, someone who is doing payments, so, so if you have a layaway or someone is asking to pay gradually for a stock item and they're bringing in cash or they're bringing in prepaid cards, and then they ask for a payment from you in a different form of payment. So if I'm I'm doing a layaway and I'm just bringing in $1,000 in cash every few days, and then I say, you know what, I've changed my mind, but don't give me back my cash. I'd like you to write me a check. Um, effectively, what they may have done at that point is just taken proceeds of crime in cash and then gotten you to launder it for them and give them back a check, which they can then deposit in their bank account and it looks much more legitimate. It's going to arouse much less suspicion on the part of their bank. So we really need to be careful about those types of things and make sure that we're monitoring for those things. And if there's something that occurs that's suspicious that we're reporting that to FinTrack. And, and again, as soon as a customer tells you that they're dealing with proceeds of crime, please, pretty please um, know that that's something that is reportable to FinTrack. For terrorist property, if you're in possession of either funds or property that you believe belongs to a terrorist or a terrorist group, um, that's a situation where you need to notify your compliance officer immediately. For the most part, um, individuals and entities that are listed as either terrorists or terrorist groups um, know that they're listed. These are publicly available lists that you can screen against. And generally speaking, um, it would be uncommon for us to see this in the industry, but if we do, we need to immediately freeze that property. So whether whether it's funds, whether we have items that we're holding in a, our vaulting system for these individuals, whether it's something that they have in for repair, um, we need to freeze that so we can't do any additional transactions. And we need to file those reports with FinTrack CSIS and the RCMP immediately. So there, there is no delay on that. If you know that you have something in your possession that belongs to a terrorist or terrorist group, that's something that you need to deal with straight away. In terms of sending reports to the compliance officer in any of these scenarios, um, we always recommend doing that as soon as, as possible, um, preferably on the same day that the transaction has occurred, because the compliance officer is then going to need to compile additional information and prepare that report for submission to FinTrack. As we talked about earlier, all of those reports have specific timelines and they're all relatively short. And so we wanna make sure that we're not dragging our feet, that we're getting those reports in on time. Um, and the best way to do that as staff members is to make sure that that information is being filtered up to our compliance officer.
One of the pieces that I think is important to remember, especially when we're talking about suspicious transactions, is that you're protected under the law. So as long as you're making that report in good faith, which means that I'm making that report because I think the transaction is suspicious, not because the person who conducted the transaction is my ex-boyfriend, and I'm really hoping that the RCMP kicks down his door because he's a jerk, but I don't actually think that he's done any criminal activity, um, that would not be in good faith. But generally speaking, when we're submitting something to FinTrack, these reports don't get admitted to court. Um, if there's something that needs to be admissible to court, we'll get production orders. So that's a request for information from law enforcement. They're in a very structured format. Um, and that's the piece that's admissible to court, not that we've filed a suspicious transaction report. And the person who is the subject of the suspicious transaction report is not aware that we, they're not made aware that we filed a report about them. And that's, I, I think, important to know because sometimes the subject of these reports can be quite scary characters. And I will pass it over to David to talk about identification. All right, thank you, Amber. Uh, so as Amber mentioned a few times, um, clients need to be identified. So we'll, we'll go through exactly what identification means and when we need to do it. Um, I'll, I'll just quickly reiterate, um, Amber did actually stress already when it needs to be done. So that is in the cash transaction, a large cash transaction situation, the large virtual currency situation and the suspicious transaction situation, whether that be attempted or a completed transaction. Um, the large cash and the large virtual currency, it is when you receive the amount. Um, there was a question in the chat. So if I receive, um, but then I'm shipping it out, uh, do I still need to report? And the answer is yes, it is about the receipts um, versus kind of where or where the, the object is going. So let's get started with types of identification methods. So the first and probably the most commonly used is the government issued photo identification method. Um, and, and this is really where a customer would present a piece of ID to you and you would record certain information, you would be looking at certain characteristics. So to be able to use a ID document for identification purposes, there's a listing there of what the document needs to be. Um, so it needs to be authentic. It needs to be issued by a provincial um, or territorial government in Canada. It can be a document that is from a foreign jurisdiction, but it needs to meet those requirements. The document should not be expired. It needs to be valid. So if somebody gives you a driver's license and it's expired, that's not an acceptable piece of ID. You need to ask for another piece. Um, and it needs to include a unique reference number, um, unique identifier number, and, and that's you know the driver's license or a passport number. It needs to have a photo. Um, so if they give you identification document that doesn't have a photo, it wouldn't meet the requirements. Um, now, in the case of your business model, if you're using government photo identification to identify a customer, this is done in person. So the staff or the customer, in, uh, the person interacting with the customer is looking at that document to make sure that it meets all those requirements and the document looks like it's an authentic document. If there are, you know, it looks like the photo is a little bit off or, you know, or doesn't even match or something like that, those are the things that needs to be escalated to the compliance officer. We can go to the next slide. Ah, provincial health cards. So we wanted to make a note here because provincial health cards for the most part do meet the obligations of a government a photo identification document that can be used to identify a customer. However, in most cases, there is legislation that prevents that from being done. Um, so just kind of be cautious of that. Quebec is one province where it is allowed, um, but in general, pro provincial health cards are not an acceptable form of identification for AML purposes. Next slide, please. Uh, so another method that can be used to identify a customer is called the dual process method. And essentially under this method, um, you're looking for two of the following. So a document or information from a reliable source that contains the customer's name and date of birth, um, a document or information from a reliable source that contains the customer's name and address, or some sort of document or information that contains the customer's name and then confirms that they actually have a deposit account or credit card or loan with a financial institution in Canada. 
Uh, so two of those documents, an example would be a utility bill and a bank statement, for instance. Uh, so long as there was that information there, they could be used as a form of identification for a customer. Um, one thing I'll note there is the document should be fairly valid and current. Um, you know, if I gave you a bank statement from three years ago, that, that wouldn't be acceptable. So I just wanted to point that out because we do actually see that when we do a effectiveness review sometimes. Sometimes the document that somebody accepted was a couple years old and that doesn't really meet the requirements. Uh, so if you have customers that are organization, the identification looks a little bit different um, and there's a couple of pieces to it. So you're obtaining information um, that will essentially prove that the organization exists. You are going to collect information related to the beneficial owners. Um, so that's anybody that owns 25% more, whether that be direct or indirect, um, you're going to collect certain information for them. And specifically for that information on the beneficial owners, you're collecting their full name, their home address, not the business address, ideally, and then the role in the organization that they play and the percentage of ownership that they have. Uh, there's also a piece here where you do have to confirm if a business is a not-for-profit. If they are a not-for-profit, then you're going to go a little bit deeper and confirm if they're a charity or if they're fund solicited for public information. And again, all this information should be recorded. So, you know, you're, you're, you may ask for the documents, but you need to confirm and record the information as well. So what happens when identification fails? Amber already touched on it, but essentially there are certain transactions that should not be completed. So in the case of that large virtual currency or large cash transaction, it should not be completed. In that example or description that I gave shortly a while ago um, for organizations, if you're not able to confirm that beneficial ownership information, you can move to confirming the CEO or the person that is acting in that role, um, confirm their identity, and then mark that customer as high risk. Um, that is acceptable under the legislation. Business relationships. So this is a terminology that not only is confusing in the DPMS sector, but many sectors of regulated entities. Uh, so just for clarification here, what this means is a customer that has transacted with you that has two or more transactions or activities in a five-year period where you needed to identify them. Um, and, and we use the word activities and transactions, but really it could be one transaction, but there's two, two cases where you need to identify them. So in that example that Amber gave about that suspicious transaction, but it involves large cash, you're identifying them because it's suspicious and for large cash. So essentially you have a business relationship with them. And essentially when you have a business relationship with a customer, there's some additional pieces that need to be done. And, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. Or not. I actually thought we had a slide on it. So I will just, sorry, Amber, if you can go back. Um, I'll just quickly say what we need to do there. So for business relationships, what you're doing is capturing one piece of additional information, which is essentially um, why they are doing business with you. So this can be something as simple as I'm purchasing jewelry for personal adornment, um, it, it, but it does need to be recorded, even if it is obvious. Once you have a business relationship with a customer, some additional pieces that come in is the confirmation or determination of a PEP or HOI. So a PEP is a politically exposed person and a, a HOI is a head of an international organization. You have to take reasonable measures to determine if a client of yours is a PEP, an HOI, a family member of a PEP or HOI or a close associate of one. Um, this is done, as I said, when you enter into a business relationship, but it also is part of your ongoing monitoring of your business relationships as well. Um, if they are a PEP, there is certain types of information that has to be recorded. So you're going to be documenting the, the office position that they are or the person that they're associated with. You're going to be collecting information co related to their source of wealth and their source of funds. And also potentially determining um, a risk factor for them. So if they are a foreign PEP, they have to be considered high risk. If they are domestic, they may not be considered high risk. You do need to perform a risk assessment there. Uh, so who is a PEP? Um, there's kind of a list here. 
um, that gives you an example of who a foreign PEP is. And one thing to note here is that once they are a foreign PEP, they are always a foreign PEP. So they're always considered high risk. If they were a head of state or a local government in another country 20 years ago, and they are now buying, you know, jewelry, and you have a business relationship with them, you are considering that person high risk. Next slide, please. So on the domestic side, there is a laundry list there. And, and as I stated already, domestic doesn't have to be considered high risk. Um, they can be high risk and, and you'll have to perform a risk assessment around that to determine that. Um, but the, DEP, the, the PEP designation only lasts for five years after they've left the position for Canada or, or domestically. And here is a example or a kind of definition of a, a head of an international organization. Um, essentially, they're a head of an institution um, from a international organization um, under government or so forth. And I think we're at the last part. I know we're a little bit short on time. So Amber, I'll kind of give that back to you and run through that quickly. Perfect. Yeah, I, I will be as efficient as possible because I know we're at the top of the hour um, and then we'll stick around for a few minutes, if that's okay with you, Alana, to just um, answer some questions that we have that have come up in the chat. Um, but we will stop recording prior to that so that we can also um, answer any additional questions um, in camera. So we have some upcoming changes in Canada, which include a beneficial ownership registry. If you're a federally registered company, you'll actually notice this when you do your updates to your registration. Um, as dealers in precious metals and stones, I highly recommend that uh, you use the feature where you can provide an address for service as, as part of your personal information as a, a beneficial owner. Um, this is a, a feature that is enabled for everyone, but if you don't use the feature where you provide an address for service, you only provide your home address, then your home address ends up part of a public registry. Um, this is also useful to us in terms of verifying our clients that are organizations and verifying beneficial ownership. There will be an expectation that as reporting entities, we are um, alerting the registry if there's any issues. So if we're getting information that's different from what appears in the registry. We also expect to see um, based on an upcoming parliamentary review of our anti-money laundering legislation, and a mutual evaluation from the International Watchdog, which is the Financial Action Task Force or FATF, some changes to Canada's AML regime. There were also some things that were just announced in the budget yesterday. And so nothing is constant but change. Um, tune in and, and we'll keep you up to date along with CJA on the upcoming changes that are pertinent to dealers in precious metals and stones. Um, this is the contact information for David and myself. Please feel free to reach out if you have questions, concerns, if you need an effectiveness review, if you need a hand with compliance. Um, that is what we are here for. And this ends the formal piece of our presentation. Uh, I will ask that at this point we pause the recording and then we'll go ahead and address any questions that we have.